Also, we really have to point out here that we notice from all of the ahadith of the Mahdi, it is never mentioned that the Mahdi will call himself the Mahdi, nor is it mentioned that he will demand that people believe in him, nor is it mentioned that he will consider those who do not believe in him to be deviants or even <laughs> non-Muslims. Rather, the Muslim Ummah shall unanimously accept him as the Mahdi. They will ask him, they will give him the allegiance. That is what the hadith says. He does not want it. They will give it to him because of his character, his piety, his leadership, all of the <laughs> blessings Allah will give him. He himself will not want it. Therefore, and this is the, really the irony of the point, the fact of the matter is that any person who starts thinking he is the Mahdi or calls people to this belief and states that anyone who opposes him is misguided or worse is a kafir has through his own actions refuted his claim to be the Mahdi because it is not reported that the Mahdi will do this. On the contrary, the Mahdi will not want to be the Mahdi. The people will come to him and they will force it upon him. And this is a sign of the Mahdi. Anyone who claims to be the Mahdi is openly promoting and boasting about it. He is the last person on the face of this earth who can possibly be the Mahdi. Likewise, anyone who claims to be the Mahdi, he has to make sure that the Dajjal comes down while he is alive. He has to make sure that Isa ibn Maryam comes down and prays behind him. Otherwise, such a person is clearly a liar. So the fact of the matter is that this idea, the idea of a Mahdi, yes, it has been misused and abused throughout the centuries. And it has been taken as a means of furthering a person's or a group's personal agenda. However, this misuse does not discredit his coming or impugn the authenticity of the ahadith narrated about him. Yet another argument that some people try to use in order to refute the idea of a Mahdi is that they claim that this belief in a Mahdi is basically a conception of the mind. It is basically an invention of some Muslims who wish to slack off in their duties and not be active in calling to the way of Allah and establishing the rules of Allah on this earth. It is as if these Muslims are waiting for a knight in shining armor to come riding out of the blue and grasp them from the clutches of their enemies. And in the meantime, the Muslims should merely sit and pray that this knight comes as fast as possible. So they claim that this is basically a type of invention of the minds of lazy Muslims and that will prevent them from doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires them from doing. Now, firstly, this is an interesting point here. It should be mentioned that scholars have differed about whether there will be a strong revivalistic movement before the coming of the Mahdi. Some scholars have opined that there are references to the fact that there will actually be a Khilafah before the coming of the Mahdi and that the Mahdi will only take over the leadership after the situation of the Ummah has been rectified to a certain extent. And they infer this from some of the ahadith that have preceded and others which in the opinion of these authorities allude to the fact that the Muslims are already unified. They are already spreading justice and truth and that the Mahdi will merely come and take over from them. As I said, there is nothing explicit about this. This is their understanding of the hadith. So some famous scholars do claim that the hadith of the Mahdi actually tell the exact opposite, that the Muslims will be unified and the Mahdi will merely come and perfect that call that has been started before him. Secondly, and more importantly, as I said, this type of thinking of sitting back and waiting for the Mahdi is definitely a problem. And such a psychological syndrome needs to be dealt with. But the way to deal with it is not in refuting the concept of the Mahdi, but rather in educating the people about the reality of the Mahdi. The Mahdi will be a normal human being. He will be a normal human being. SubhanAllah, he is even not as practicing as he should be before he repents on that one night that the Prophet Sallallahu told us about. He is not even as practicing as he should be. What a normal human being. He is not a supernatural, all-powerful hero who will come single-handedly to save the entire Ummah. The Mahdi will need the support of the entire Muslim Ummah. No doubt, he will act as a catalyst and a leader figure and through him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless the Ummah in a way that it has not been blessed before. But the Mahdi will need the help of the hundreds and thousands of people around him. Without them, the Mahdi will not be able to achieve anything. And as I said before, even though I personally do not share with some of the scholars their belief or their opinion that there is any type of reference to a political force of Muslims before the advent of the Mahdi, still there is no doubt that the Mahdi will need the help of the Muslims. And how will he get this help when the Muslims themselves are not worthy of it? 
In other words, the Mahdi will come. He needs a following. Where will this following come from? He cannot form it. He only has seven years. He will come. The people will give him bay'ah right then and there. And from then on, the call of the Mahdi will spread. So, in my humble opinion, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, it is clear that there will be a lot of Islamic revival in the academic, in the spiritual, in the religious sense, perhaps not in the political sense, but there is no doubt, insha'Allah ta'ala, that before the coming of the Mahdi, there will be a lot of Islamic revival and people will be returning to their religion, practicing it, studying it, coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if this revival does not necessarily lead to a strong political entity. Also, a Muslim is required to stand for truth and justice wherever he is, regardless of whether the Mahdi is there or not. A Muslim is required to implement Islam in all places and times. He is required to support his religion and aid in spreading it through any and all legitimate means and channels. Look at how many ulama, how many mujaddidun, how many revivalist movements came throughout the centuries of Islam. Look at how many academic, political and religious leaders that were produced that really and truly brought about a change in the Muslim Ummah. None of them said, why should I do anything when the Mahdi will be coming? Imagine if these great leaders, if these great scholars, imagine if they had refused to do their good, if they had become lackadaisical and relied upon the emergence of a Mahdi figure, what would have happened? So simply, this is not the attitude of a true believer. The real mu'min is always proactive. He is always thinking about what he can do to better his own situation and the situation of the Muslims around him. He doesn't just sit back and let others do the work for him or await the coming of a person more grand and blessed than he is. Such an attitude will only be harmful to him in this world and the hereafter and will not be of any help at all to the Muslim Ummah. So, regardless of whether the Muslims will have a political power or khilafah before the Mahdi or after, the fact of the matter is that we are still obliged to study our religion, to practice it, to implement it in all of its facets, and to teach and preach it to others. I'd like to conclude this series of lectures by quoting a hadith which really and truly is one of my favorite hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a hadith that shows us the spirit of Islam. And it is narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullahu ta'ala on the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala an who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, if the day of judgment is called and one of you has a seedling in his hand, then if he can plant it before the judgment is called, let him do so. Ponder over this hadith. If the day of judgment is called and you have a seedling in your hand, you have a small plant, you're about to plant it, and the day of judgment is called. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you can plant it before the day of judgment, do so. Look at this beautiful hadith. Even if the trumpet is being blown and you're about to plant a seedling, do it. The point of the hadith is that a Muslim always looks how he can be of benefit to others. And this hadith is really poignant in that, firstly, why would you want to plant a tree when the entire creation is about to be destroyed? I mean, who would benefit from such a tree? And secondly, when the actual trumpet is blown, there will be no Muslims on the face of this earth. There will be nobody who knows this hadith. The trumpet will be blown upon a group of people who do not even know Allah. They will be the worst of mankind. So the Prophet ﷺ is not really addressing the actual people who will be alive at the day of judgment. He is addressing me and you. He is talking to us and he is telling us to be proactive, do something of benefit, do something positive. And that is the spirit of Islam. When the Mahdi comes, Alhamdulillah, much good will come with him. But until that time, we have a lot of work to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the sincerity to worship him and him alone. And may he make us knowledgeable of the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. May he make us amongst the hudat and mahdiyin. May he make us amongst those who are rightly guided and rightly guide others. And may he make us amongst those who implement the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam upon the methodology of the pious predecessors. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. You're listening to Muslim Audio. You can find us on the web at muslimaudio.com.